So, tell me where it all began. All right. Hi, my name is Scott, and I'm not an alcoholic. My name isn't Scott, and this isn't an AA meeting. No, oh, thank God. I always hated those. I always felt out of place. I wish they would make it more accessible to non-alcoholics. You're stalling. I'm sitting. We can do this the easy way or the hard way. I'm paying you. With a coupon! You don't know what it's like to go to therapy. Hey, I got a life outside of this job. I go to therapy twice a week. You're a therapist. Where do you go to therapy? The mirror. All right, fine. It all started at my desk. Hey all, Scott here. So is this the first time you introduce yourself like that, or is this a reoccurring thing? Pretty much every week. Say, do you want me to play three of Nintendo's worst games of all time to end up wasting thousands of dollars in therapy? That was some incredible foresight. I plan my year ahead of time. Picture this. Making bad games. It's like making bad water. It's almost impossible. But some people just can't help themselves. Almost every video game company has stumbled at some point, whether they had to rush a title out for release or just weren't focused enough during development. Mistakes happen and one bad or misguided game doesn't mean an entire studio is talentless or doomed. Just because Sega made one oopsie doesn't mean they'll make another one anytime soon. Bad example, but regardless of how many stinkers are put out each and every year, people will always hold certain developers and publishers in the highest regards. These studios can never make a bad game. They always push for quality, they always care about their products, and you will never be disappointed in what they make. One of these companies is Nintendo, a developer and publisher widely believed to put out nothing but quality titles. I finally figured out what this statement is! Listen, I love this company. Nintendo is my favorite game studio of all time. I love most of their games, their developers, their philosophies, their style, their history. They are, to me, the most interesting player in the video game industry. And their level of quality since their inception has yet to be matched. It's simply astonishing how time and time again they've been able to create so many experiences that are considered genre-defining and consistently at that. From the original Super Mario Brothers in 1985 to The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild in 2017, they've been the studio to look up to. But there's sort of a misconception to many that Nintendo doesn't make bad games. The idea many push that Nintendo always puts the most quality possible into each and every game they release. They never rush things. They never go for quick cash grabs. That is hilarious. Will you be here all week? I love this company, but I'm more than willing to point out their shortcomings. And one year I felt that harder than any other year, 2015. This was during the Wii U and Nintendo 3DS era, the anti-renaissance. Definitely not their strongest in terms of sales and revenue, and Nintendo's handheld business has always been their most successful, and while the 3DS was doing well, it wasn't nearly as big of a breakout hit as the Nintendo DS or Game Boy lineup systems. And then there was the Wii U, also known as what? Yeah, that wasn't doing all too hot, so Nintendo decided, f**k it, let's give up. Up until this point, investors were dogging on the company quite a bit to put their titles on smartphones. Their idea was, Angry Birds is doing it, why not Starfy? But Nintendo was always stern about keeping their games on their devices, especially considering mobile gaming was a threat to dedicated handhelds like the 3DS. However, in March of 2015, the company officially announced that sinning was on the schedule. It just made sense to develop mobile games. At this time, the 3DS was mostly appealing to just core fans, and the Wii U appealed to just me. Nintendo's brand wasn't as widely recognizable as it could be in this era, so they decided, let's make a shitty Mario Kart game for smartphones in 2019. But did the switch to mobile games mean Nintendo was going to put an end to console development? God no! Because they announced development of a future console at the same time, the Nintendo NX. So that meant in 2015, not only were Wii U and 3DS titles being developed, but mobile and NX games as well. Nintendo was obviously being stretched a bit thin here. The Nintendo NX wasn't going to be released until March of 2017, but they were feverishly working on it in the back to ensure this doesn't happen again. But they still had to put out Wii U and 3DS games, and with some of their titles getting delayed a bit from a 2015 launch, they had to scramble. They had to whip up games that reused old assets, had little content to them, or were just ungodly simple so they could have products to sell that year. This went on from 2015 to 2016, low-quality spin-offs that barely anybody wanted, or games that showed promise that ended up completely under-delivering. I'd say 2016 had less going on, just overall the amount of titles released wasn't that high and the quality wasn't much higher. But this problem started the year prior. It was weird because 2015 no doubt had some great games developed and or published by Nintendo. 
Splatoon, Super Mario Maker, Yoshi's Woolly World, Xenoblade Chronicles X, but we also had Devil's Third, Pokemon Super Mystery Dungeon, Mario Party 10, Mario vs. Donkey Kong Tipping Stars, Animal Crossing Happy Home Designer, Little Battlers Experience, Amiibo Tap, The Legend of Zelda, Triforce Heroes, Codename Steam, all getting anywhere from mixed to negative reception from critics and fans alike. The Triforce Heroes and Happy Home Designer were okay in my opinion. The Devil's Third had its moments, and I always put Mario Party 10 on the shelf like this. I never want to see those three words together ever again. These games, while not terrible, just didn't have the same level of quality as what I came to expect from Nintendo. They all felt a bit soulless in one way or another. Like, these weren't made because, oh, we want to do this, instead more like, oh, we need a Zelda game this year. However, there were three games released in 2015 I believe to be nearly irredeemable. Some of the biggest mistakes Nintendo's ever made. Games I consider to make up the Dark Age of Nintendo. Big deal. That is the best thing a therapist could say to me. You shouldn't let the products of a multi-billion dollar children's company affect your mental health. You don't understand, I have to play most Luigi-based products! Well, I think it's a good time to practice anything but sobriety, so let's take a look at three of Nintendo's worst games of all time, which, weirdly enough, all released within two months of each other. First one we should tackle is... Ah! Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival, The Rise of the Machines. Touch an amiibo? <laughs> so a little backstory, Animal Crossing, one of the most comfortable gaming experiences in the county, it's just life. You collect stuff to get money to pay off your loan to buy more stuff, it's depressing, this is what life is, why do I like this? Truth be told, I am far from being one of the bigger Animal Crossing fans out there, it's not that I don't like the series, far from it, I just haven't played each entry to death like many others have. But the games I have played are so relaxing and cozy. They're just fun to boot up, run a few little errands, turn it off and depress for the rest of the day. There was a bit of criticism directed towards the series for a while there though. See, it initially released on the Nintendo 64 in Japan only. That version made its way to the GameCube worldwide with a few extra enhancements, but it was still the same game at heart. Then when Wild World came to the DS, many noted it was pretty similar to the GameCube one with a few enhancements added. City Folk released on the Wii and it was pretty similar to the DS one with a few enhancements added. Where were the changes? F go back! These games kept adding onto each other, but not enough for some to be all too thrilled. But then New Leaf for the 3DS came out, and it changed up enough to be a breath of fresh air for everybody. You were the mayor of your town, you could change so much about your village, it's the one thing Animal Crossing needed, and they finally did it, government intervention! New Leaf was a tremendous success, and all signs were pointing to the next iteration of Animal Crossing releasing on Wii U around 2015. I mean, it had to happen! Right? I mean, in 2013, Nintendo released this app called Animal Crossing Plaza on the system. It was all these characters in HD, and you could create Miiverse posts about them for others around the world to read. Considering this free app was made so 3DS owners who played New Leaf could talk about the game only on Wii U, a platform that did not have an Animal Crossing game, was only available for a year until it was discontinued and can no longer be accessed. I smell pointless! It was by all accounts the Miiverse Plaza, that thing that appears when you boot up your Wii U, showing all these Miis and what people are saying about different games. It was that, but for Animal Crossing characters. Like you could say, oh fuck, I love this guy's pants. And then others could respond with, why am I on this app? I think the main takeaway from this thing was that Nintendo produced all these HD quality models of the Animal Crossing characters. I think it was pretty evident that this was a test when it came to developing an HD game in the series. However, nothing initially came of this. New Leaf kept selling, Animal Crossing Plaza kept not getting used, and all was right with the world. But then in 2014, Nintendo announced and released Amiibo figures with NFC chips in their base that allowed you to scan them into supported games via the Wii U gamepad and eventually the 3DS to play with the character or unlock extra goodies. It launched with Super Smash Bros. for Wii U and was a tremendous success, mainly because they released Amiibo of all characters. Smash Bros. is a crossover of every series under the sun, so everybody was interested in the line to some extent. This meant in the following year, Nintendo would lean heavily into Satan's plastic. More lines of Amiibo like Super Mario, Splatoon, Yoshi's Woolly World were all put out and did very well, but the actual use of these things in games was always not essential. In Smash Brothers, you could scan a figure to fight it, raise it, and level it up as your own little Smash Brothers prodigy. That was pretty much the furthest they ever went with implementing it. Mario Party 10, you'd use them in Amiibo Party Mode where you scan an Amiibo to roll the dice. Yoshi's Woolly World and Mario Maker, you could scan a bunch of different ones to get costumes, which was awesome, but not all Amiibo were supported in every game. It was kind of up in the air which Amiibo would be supported in which games. So I think we were all expecting a game to be released that took full advantage of Amiibo, a game that couldn't exist without it. We should have known better. But in the back of everybody's mind, we were also thinking another thing. New Animal Crossing game for Wii U with Animal Crossing Amiibo support. 
It was so perfect. It just had to happen. Animal Crossing was a game so focused on collecting in hundreds of different characters, introducing figures, that just made a ton of sense. Well, Nintendo jumped on this fairly quickly. In April of 2015, we got Animal Crossing Amiibo cards announced alongside a spin-off title for 3DS, Happy Home Designer. This was a sign. They were building up to a Wii U game. I could smell it, and Happy Home Designer would interact with it somehow. They weren't pulling a fast one on me. I eat virginity for breakfast. I get these things. E3 2015 came around. Guess what leaked beforehand? Boom! Animal Crossing Amiibo figures. It was happening. Nintendo's E3 2015 digital event kicked off. Halfway through, a Happy Home Designer trailer played. Then those glorious words world premiere flew up on screen. It cuts to a Wii U gamepad. Holy sh**. And an Animal Crossing figure gets scanned onto it. Holy sh**. Animal Crossing's on Wii U, I called it! I CALLED IT! So you, you got incredibly depressed over the announcement of a game in a series that you aren't even a huge fan of to begin with in the first place. That's right. On your left, you will see no doubt one of the worst and tone-deaf video game announcements of all time. You can't tell me somebody at Nintendo didn't realize what opening a trailer with this shot insinuates. Nobody goes, oh my god, an Animal Crossing board game? Because that's what it was, a party game that used amiibo figures to roll the dice. <laughs> Nearly everybody was disappointed and confused, but while this wasn't what I wanted in the slightest, I had higher hopes than I think some did. And the idea of an Animal Crossing party game wasn't bad. That's all it had going for it. The idea wasn't bad. Because my god, not only was this game's announcement a disappointment, the gameplay shown? What is this? Later on at E3, tidbits about why the game existed were coming out. One of them being how the developers just wanted a reason for Animal Crossing Amiibo to exist. I can think of worse reasons for the apocalypse. Another one, albeit this was just a Nintendo of America employee kind of just talking up the game a bit on the E3 Treehouse stream, was that they said it was nice to have an Animal Crossing game that didn't require reading to enjoy. Most of this game is text. Suffice to say, Amiibo Festival was not received well. It just sort of got announced and then released later that November. And nothing really came out about the game until a Nintendo Direct in November highlighted it. A day before it released, there was a rumor floating around about the game being a free download and you'd just need to buy an Animal Crossing figure to experience it. $60 that I spent! So this is Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival. It comes in this box with two Amiibo figures and three Amiibo cards in this nice little envelope. Now apparently Digby here was only available for a limited time. Future releases of the bundle wouldn't include him. If only the game sold well enough to warrant them doing that. Amiibo Festival bombed. Stores are still putting it out on clearance to this very day. Like I said, the original plan was to phase Digby out of the bundle, but that never happened because I think stores are still trying to sell the initial batch of the game from 2015. Well, there are other Animal Crossing Amiibo that launched alongside it, so I might as well nab a few to get the full experience. I didn't even try and I own nearly all of them. All I did was go to Five Below, a GameStop, and a quick dabble on eBay, and here we are. Under $60 later, I own pretty much all of these except for Rover, Celeste, and Smur- is a <laughs> These figures also rot in clearance bins. Nintendo definitely expected them to fly off the shelves like the Smash Brothers line did, but they didn't understand that one, that line appealed to everybody because it included dozens of different game franchises. Animal Crossing, while incredibly popular, only appeals to Animal Crossing fans. And two, nobody wanted figures that were only useful in a bad game. So you can pretty much find all of these for dirt cheap. I mean, I know I did. Five bones a piece at five below, where garbage goes to die. I picked up two packs of Animal Crossing Amiibo cards as well. These did far better sales-wise. They got up to four different series released. I assume it's because collecting hundreds of Animal Crossing cards is a lot more fun and addicting than buying one figure. So opening these up, I got Shirt Wolf, Spunk Rat, Unemployed Mouse, Insomnia Duck, Better Than Me Gazelle, Bride of an Aardvark, Self-Conscious Dog, Ye Old Lion, Hair Duck, Sex Frog, Kyle, and Mammal. Alright, so now I own multiple Animal Crossing Amiibo cards, I have nearly all of the Animal Crossing Amiibo figures, and the game is officially in my Wii U. And then... It happened. The gout? No. Virginity. Alright, tap an Amiibo on the Wii U gamepad, let's go with Spunk Rat! It's gonna be one of those games, isn't it? This is an amiibo, why can't I enter? All right, fine, we'll try Clearance Otter. If you ever wanted an otter on clearance, buy a Lottie amiibo. Tapping a figure brings us to the plaza. Our main option here is the board game. Well, I couldn't possibly play Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival by myself. What do I look like, a fucking loser? I at least need to play Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival with one other person. Oh, fuck no, fuck no, I'm not playing it, no, no!
I'm telling the story in past tense. I am forwarding this message to everybody in my contacts list. If you stop by tonight, we can play... Gex. <gasps> Did not take you as a Gex fan. I'm not. I know you were lying, and I'll do anything not Gex related. Even Amiibo Festival? Yeah. Is it Gex night? I've been waiting for this for years. Yeah. Oh, I love Gex! So we enter the world of Gex by tapping our amiibo in and on with the board game. Now we have 12 boards to choose from all the months throughout the year, and honestly it's a great idea in terms of transitioning the series into a board game. It's all about life and the time of year translating over to the game. You can still find positives in hell. We get the rules explained to us and this is gonna take an hour and a half to finish. Do we really have enough stamina to last that long? I haven't eaten since yesterday two weeks ago. Yeah, and I know Gex, an hour and a half is really lowballing it. Okay, we'll buy some food. All right, what do you guys want? I only have enough money for one thing we can all share. Doesn't matter to me. Yeah, I'm starving. I couldn't care less right now. All right. I, uh, I'll, I'll take one corn dog. You went to Sonic? Not just that, I ate there. Should have came sooner. So when you have some players to play a real life video game with, before you start a game, you need to make sure you and your team are nourished. This is gonna take a whole lot of effort and time, and the last thing you want anybody to do during a game of Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival is leave to do something else. When commitment is your middle name, it's time to play. Scan your Amiibo when it's your turn and lift it to roll the dice. Move the spaces given. You want to gain happy points and bells. Land on spaces that either make you happy or give you money. Some spaces only do one or the other or both. But some spaces take away one or the other or both. Every space you land on, you get a little story play out that explains why you gained happy points and or bells or why you lost them. I have never meant anything more in my life than what I'm about to say. Cute, I guess. Sometimes events happen where characters show up and if you land on a certain space, they may give you an item to use. These items are all sorts of basic cards that let you move whatever amount of spaces you want. They're f***ing fun! Joan appears every now and then and sells you turnips. You buy a bunch and then the market does the talking. Each space then has a different selling price for your turnips, so it's up to you to decide when it's time to sell your stock. Investment's a core part of the game. Again, great for people who can't read. And that's Amiibo Festival. When every player takes a turn moving, the next day starts and you repeat until the month is over. Your bells are converted to happy points at the end and are added to your overall total and whoever has the most happy points wins. Now you can set a time limit so the game ends after a certain period rather than lasting an hour and a half, but that's not the Amiibo Festival way, damn it. Rev up your endurance glance because we're in this for the long haul. He's a gecko with sunglasses! So yes, we constantly have to scan our amiibo to roll the dice each and every time. Is it strategic? Is the dice roll slow to compensate for the fact it has to read a chip in the figurine? Is scanning an amiibo to roll dice fun? Don't quote me on this, but no. If you want to play with up to four players, but you only have one to three amiibo, the remaining players can play as a human villager, and all they have to do is hit A. Come on, that's no fair! Using an amiibo to do this is clunky and annoying, primarily because you constantly have to do it. Other games that support amiibo, it's a one and done. You scan it, and then you set the figure down. Here, you constantly have to, and it is grating mainly because I know there is a beautiful little button that can roll the dice for me, and then some right there. It's even programmed into the game! But I have to keep scanning something about it five below. But here's what I really don't like. Like, after you scan, you then have to use the stick and A button to confirm which direction you want to go in when you reach different path options. One of my biggest pet peeves in games, specifically on the Wii U, is when they force you to use the controller in a way that makes you reposition your hands when it is completely unnecessary. Paper Mario Color Splash on the Wii U did this. Its default control scheme had you pick cards to play with the touchscreen, then force you to quickly shift your hands back to the buttons to time your actions properly. I ended up switching to the all button control scheme, because sure, there are more steps required with this than with the advanced touch controls option, but here, I don't need to reposition my hands constantly. In Amiibo Festival, I have to scan the figure, use the buttons, sometimes I'm forced to use the touchscreen for no damn reason. If the developers just had to absolutely force you to scan the Amiibo to roll the dice, why not have the rest of the controls on the touchscreen? And that way you can leave the gamepad on a table without it being sort of kind of awkward to use when picking a direction. Like, why not be able to select the direction to go in on the touchscreen? Oh, that's right, you can't because the emotion buttons are on the touchscreen. Yes! The game has some weird consistency issues when it comes to what's exclusively on the gamepad screen and what's not. And there's really nothing that ever happens where I think, oh man, I don't want to hide what I'm looking at from the other players. Also, we all just use one gamepad, pass it around like a corn dog. It just makes things unnecessarily cumbersome. The game itself reeks of Mario Party. I mean, happy points are basically stars and bells are coins. Of course, more coins mean more of a chance to get a star in Mario Party, which is what you're really after, and it's no different with Amiibo Festival. The difference is, most Mario Parties have a mini gameplay after each player rolls their dice and move. That adds an element of skill. You want to do good at the minigames to get more coins to get more stars. After everybody rolls an Amiibo Festival, 
You roll again! There's no mini games, no nothing! This game is just constantly rolling the dice and moving around the board. Sure, you have the element of the fucking onions. I guess you have to strategize when's the right time to sell them. And no, even that's total luck. You can't strategize landing on a space where you can sell them for a fortune. It's all up to the dice roll. But Scott, you may say, what? You can get special cards that give you the ability to move a specific amount of spaces. Yeah, sure, but if you even get the opportunity to get a card like that, completely random. If you get the number of spaces you'd actually need in the future, completely random. It's all luck. You build up your bills for 45 minutes all for a damn owl to bump into you and take half your money. The most strategy you can put into this game is doing a trick when scanning your amiibo. Now that. Badass. I mean, if Amiibo Festival nails anything, it's the ambiance of Animal Crossing. Every space you land on tells you the story of what happened to your character that day. It's all well written, I guess, but keep in mind, there is way too much dialogue for this being a party game. I have multiple people in the room, Katie. You don't need to explain your purpose each and every time somebody runs into you. Presentation-wise, like, yeah, it's still Animal Crossing. It looks okay, but it just kind of feels like they barf New Leaf in HD without all too much care put into it. It's fine, it does the job, but the board's design, my... God! So yes, each board is each month in the year, but they're barely any different. The season changes, but that doesn't make any of them feel all too distinct. There are events that happen based on the month, like holidays or birthdays, but I will maintain, every board feels the damn same. Here's a quiz for you. Which board is June and which board is July? They're both August. You level up your character after every game and save that data to the amiibo. Thank God I get something out of this. Leveling up with your happy points unlocks new costumes. You know, now this game has purpose. And that's the board game, but you just wait because we have so much more to this. Eight mini games, in fact. All of which are exclusively playable with amiibo cards. You cannot use figures. Is there any reason why I can't use the amiibo cards in the board game and amiibo figures in the mini games? Man, you really haven't played Dex before. Or have you? So we basically have to grind in this game for a couple hours to unlock everything. We have Balloon Island, where we scan in an amiibo card and lift it up to drop our character at the right time to get the most points. I will say, this is an instance where scanning the cards makes this a bit more interesting. You have to take the delay into account. I think it would be way more interesting if different characters had different characteristics to how they drop, so there's more of a strategy when picking your card. But overall, this would be a bit weird without the cards. It's weird with the cards. Acorn Chase. We have to maneuver this garden, picking up all the acorns by scanning one of the three cards you pick to go in different directions before you get mauled. It's... Fine. Rossetti Bob, so it's whack-a-mole mixed with rock, paper, scissors. Finally, somebody did it. All the amiibo cards have either rock, paper, or scissors on them, so you scan them in, and when you see a Rossetti with rock under it, and you are definitely paper, scan your card, nothing else matters in the world. It can get pretty crazy, although an easy way to cheese it is if you scan in all characters with the same thing, that way it's not nearly as confusing. Mystery Campers, we scan in six cards and have to try to guess which four of your characters are in the tents and which order they're in. This one's honestly incredibly simple, but kind of fun. It really makes you think critically. Every time you scan in four, it tells you how many were correct and if you were close with some of your picks. It's pretty satisfying to figure it all out considering all your previous choices. Speaking of thinking critically, the Animal Crossing Quiz Show, the perfect game to play with people who don't know Animal Crossing all too well. What is this? <laughs> it's a fish! Amiibo card battle, you pick cards to play and there are definitely outcomes. I don't get this one. Desert Island Escape. This is the most game this game gets. It's not that bad. You pick three characters and you have to survive on an island long enough and find materials to escape before time runs out. You just have to strategize where to move and if certain things are worth risking. It's nothing amazing, but it's probably the most value you'll get out of Amiibo Festival. And that was Amiibo Festival. Gex. Gex, but we played the entirety of what it had to offer. Didn't we forget the Fruit Path game? Get, get the f*** out of my house. So Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival is generally considered the lowest point of the Animal Crossing franchise. It is, but I think what stings the most is the fact that it didn't need to be. Of course, best case scenario, it would be an actual real-life Animal Crossing for the Wii U, but an Animal Crossing party game had so much potential. The core concept here is fantastic. Taking elements from Animal Crossing and turning them into a board game, having the boards be different months, holidays as different events that happen, but they didn't do anything interesting with these concepts. ND Cube made this game and they developed the modern Mario Party and Wii Party games. And by God, I just don't think they know how to balance the game's content or design boards for party games. They always try to give as many options as possible to give the illusion of a ton of content with tons of modes or mini games, but everything is so bare bones, it doesn't matter. It would have been better if they found a way to mesh all the content in here together. That way it could have been at least a little more interesting. Amiibo Festival by far is the worst game they've ever developed. But it's not ungodly terrible.
It's bad, no doubt, but some of the extra minigames aren't the worst, and the board game can be fun if you want to overreact about everything happening. However, that mode is overly long with nothing of value ever happening. The control scheme is completely unnecessary, and with each amiibo costing around 13 bucks a pop at launch, you were spending well over $100 when this game released to play with multiple characters and access the other minigames. The concept's great! The execution is abysmal. However, I can't say it's the worst thing ever. There are glimpses of hope in the package here and there. So, it's not terrible, it's just... Awful. Well, I think overall you're experiencing post game syndrome. It should wear off between the next day or two. Uh, I'm surprised it only took you one game to get this shaken. Well, actually, I'm here because it was more so a barrage of bad Nintendo games I played. Uh, first, it was Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival. Next, it was Mario Tennis Ultra Smash. Okay, bye. <laughs>